Welcome everyone. It is so good to have you here this weekend, whether you're joining us in Dixon City or Wilkesbury or Clark Summit. Great to have you here wherever here is for you. And uh, my prayer today is simply this, that you'll not just hear my voice, but you'll hear the voice of God speaking to you in a very personal and very powerful way, and that you'll leave here in a few minutes as a little bit different person because of our time together. Today we're beginning a brand new teaching series. It's entitled Faith in Motion. And uh, over the next couple of months, we're going to be talking about what it means for us to live out, for us to put in motion the things that we say we believe. And uh, I, was, I was thinking about this recently uh, when, when I heard some news. Uh, give me some background. We as a church have a Facebook page. I think you all know that. And it, it really is a great communication tool for us. But in, in the Facebook world, if you're an organization, people can go on Facebook and they can click this little button that says like, and they can like your organization. And what that means basically is that they, they're, they have a positive feeling about you, they want to connect with you, and it creates this information flow uh, between the two of you. But if, if you own the Facebook page, if you're the organization, there's a little box on there that tells you how many likes you have. And uh, about a month ago, somebody brought it to my attention that we had hit kind of a milestone in the Facebook world where we had a thousand likes on our Facebook page. And I thought, you know, that's kind of cool. I, I, I like the idea that there are a thousand people out there who actually like church because I think there are lots of people who don't like church. And when I was growing up, I'm not sure I even liked church and I became a pastor. So I thought, well, that's a pretty cool thing that we got like over a thousand likes. And so this past week, I did a little bit more digging, and I discovered that there's also a Facebook page about the topic of Christianity, and that Facebook page has over 14 million likes. And I thought, well, that's interesting. And then I discovered that, believe it or not, someone in, somebody has actually created a Facebook page for Jesus himself. And on his Facebook page, he has over 800,000 likes, and I'm sure that he's very happy about that. But I'm thinking about this, and, and here's the conclusion that I, that I eventually came to, and it's this. It's one thing to like church, and to like Jesus, and to like Christianity. It's an entirely different thing to live it. See, you can sit at home on your couch in your pajamas and click a button on your laptop computer, and you can say, I like Christianity. But if you really want to live it and not just like it, guess what you have to do? you got to get off the couch. There's got to be something that happens in your heart. you got to go out into the world, and you've got to start making a difference because there's a huge difference between liking something and living something. And here's what I want for us. I want for us to be a church that not only likes what we talk about around here on weekends, but we actually live it. And, and that's what we're going to be talking about over the next uh, about 12 weeks in this new weekend series. We're actually going to make our way through one single book of the Bible. It's called the book of James. It's in the New Testament. And, and I love the book of James because it's just very clear, not hard to figure out. It's not complicated. And there's one very obvious theme that runs throughout this entire book of the Bible, and I think it's summarized very, very well in chapter 2, verse 17. This is like, in a sentence, the theme of the entire book of James. Uh, it says this, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is, and what's that last word? Let's all say it together. It is what? It's all right, we've got to try that again for the people in Wilkes-Barre because they're new to this whole thing. So faith by itself, if, if it is not accompanied by action, let's say it really loud, is what? It's dead. dead. That's very good. And if something is dead, it's motionless, useless, and it's lifeless. So if your faith is authentic, if your faith is alive, it will be in motion. See, it's going to change the way that you live. It's going to change the way that you speak. It's going to change that you, the way that you respond to the circumstances of life because real faith is a faith that's always in motion. 
So let's jump into the book of James. If, if uh, you have a Bible, you can turn there. Uh, you can also take the note sheet out of the bulletin. The entire passage that we'll look at today is on that note sheet. You can also see it on the side screens as well. I would encourage you uh, to fill in the blanks on that note sheet and also take advantage of the scripture readings on the back throughout this week after you leave here today. Now there's some very, very important background information right here in verse 1. Here's how it begins. James... And in those days, when they wrote letters, and this is a letter, when they wrote letters, they would start with their name. It was much simpler that way. James, the servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, a little bit, bit of background here. This was written by James. And James was the brother of Jesus, technically half-brother. Uh, they both had the same mom, Mary, uh, but uh, Jesus had a heavenly father. So they're half-brothers. And James was the spiritual leader of the church in the city of Jerusalem. He was the pastor of the church in Jerusalem, which is where, obviously, Christianity began. And so all of the very first believers came from a Jewish background, which is why it goes on to say this, James, to the 12 tribes, that's a way of describing the people of Israel. They were broken into 12 tribes. These were Jewish believers. To the 12 tribes scattered among the nations. Now, here's a very important question. Why were they scattered among the nations? Well, let me answer that question for you. When the church began in the first century, things went well for the first few years. But then things took a very ugly turn. And the believers in the city of Jerusalem began to be harassed and hounded and persecuted. And eventually they were scattered. Let me read this from Acts chapter 8. This is the history of the first century church. It says, A great persecution broke out against the church at Jerusalem, and all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. And so the reason why James writes this letter is because he wants to encourage his fellow believers who have been uprooted and who have been persecuted and who are now scattered. And so this letter was written, and then it would have been copied, and it would have been handed along to different groups of believers. And when they got together to worship, they would read this and they would talk about it. So essentially, James was the pastor of a first century multi-site church. And if he had had video, I think he would have used that, but he used the latest technology they had in that day, which was ink and parchment. So he writes this letter to people who are brand new believers. Their, their financial security is gone. All their relationships have been broken apart. They're scattered all over the place. They've been persecuted. And uh, they're wondering at this point, you know, where is God in all this? Why is this happening? How do we respond to all this? And so at the very beginning of this letter, as James begins to write this letter, he addresses the problem of suffering. And he talks about, and we're going to talk about this question, how do you put your faith in motion when life gets difficult? What does it mean to have a faith that's in motion even in the, in, in, when the bottom falls out of your life? Because when life gets difficult, you can get very bitter, you can begin to turn away from God, and you can kind of derail your faith and your emotions. So what do we do when life gets difficult? Let me begin as we talk here about suffering, about a very common myth, and this is one of the reasons why we don't respond well sometimes to suffering and why it's so confusing to us. There's a myth that goes something like this, that if I do good, then God will be good to me, and if I do bad, then God will make me suffer. In Hinduism, it's called karma. In popular culture, it goes something like this, what goes around comes around. And, and a lot of people view suffering that way, that if something is not going well in my life, I must have done something to offend God, and if things are great in my life, then I must really be impressing God. In fact, do you remember the, uh, the old movie, uh, The Sound of Music? My, my daughters love this movie, and we've, we've watched it together a couple of times. And, and there's a scene in the movie where Captain Von Trapp and Maria have fallen in love, and they sing this song together. It goes like this, nothing comes from nothing. Nothing ever could. So somewhere in my youth or childhood, I must have done something good. For here you are standing there loving me, whether or not you should. So somewhere in my youth or childhood, I must have done something good. At that point, you applaud. <laughs> now, <clears throat> see, here's the problem. A lot of people have a sound of music theology when it comes to suffering. They think if my life is going good, it must be because I'm good. If my life is going not so good, it's because I'm not so good. Now, certainly there are times 
when we have pain in our lives because of our own choices and it's the consequences of our own sin. But that's not always the case. In fact, usually that is not the case living in this very, very broken world. And so here's what I want you to understand today. Like this entire message could be summed up in this one single sentence. It is this, pain is not God's way of beating me up. It is his way of growing me up. That when pain invades my life, that's not God trying to beat me up. That may be God's way of growing me up. Whether that pain is self-inflicted because of my own choices or it comes from something beyond my control, either way, it's true. Our Heavenly Father, if you're a follower of Christ, your Heavenly Father wants to leverage that pain in a way to help you become someone that you need to be. So I want to talk about four things that we need to do if we're going to cooperate with God in that growth process. If our faith is in motion in times of difficulty, here are four things that we're going to do. Number one, I need to rejoice when I just want to complain. And let's face it, does complaining make your problems any smaller? No. And nobody's going to show up at the pity party that you keep giving out invitations for anyway. So here's what it says in verse 2. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds. Now let's just stop right there. If you were to just hear me say that and not know that that was in the Bible... You might think to yourself, oh, come on, Mark, that is ridiculous. I mean, what world are you living in? But, uh, but imagine living in the first century and being one of the Christians who got this letter, okay? You've been uprooted, you've been persecuted, you're separated from everything dear to you, you have no financial security, and you get a letter from your pastor, and he says, consider it pure joy. <laughs> now, that sounds strange, right? especially to our ears as Americans because we live in this culture that is so addicted to comfort and convenience. But let, let me give you something that may help you to swallow this a little bit easier. You need to understand that this is not calling us to feel a certain way. It's calling us to think a certain way. It does not say that you should enjoy your problems. This is not telling us that when something bad in our lives, we should be happy, happy, happy. It's a way of thinking. It's a perspective on life. It's a way of looking at your problems and looking at the difficulties in your life. Consider it. Think of it. See it through this lens. Consider it pure joy when, whenever you face trials of many kinds. And here's why. Because you know something. Because if you're a believer, you know something the rest of the world doesn't know. That there is a God there. A powerful, loving God who has the ability to take everything in your life and to use it in such a way that something good can result in your heart from it. Because you know this. You know that the testing of your faith develops, produces perseverance. I want to highlight one single word there in verse 3. It's the word testing. The word testing. And in the Bible, whenever this word is used, it's almost always used in reference to the process of refining metal. Job chapter 23, verse 10. Speaking of God, but he knows the way that I take, and when he has tested me, I will come forth as gold. Proverbs 17, verse 3, the crucible for silver and the furnace for gold, but the Lord tests the heart. It's talking about a refining process. One of my, uh, one of my first jobs after high school was working at a foundry. I, I worked with molten aluminum and molten zinc. I actually still have a couple of scars to prove it. But in, in the refining process, what happens is the raw metal, or sometimes even the scrap metal, is heated in a furnace up to the melting point. And when the metal reaches the melting point, all the impurities rise to the surface, and then you can take off, you can scrape off all the impurities, and what is left is metal that is more pure and more strong and more valuable than it was before. And the point of the passage is this, that is, it is in the furnace of life, it is in the difficult circumstances that character is forged, that faith is deepened, that you become a person that you would not otherwise be. It's in the heat of those trials that God is creating something in us that otherwise may not be there. And that's why I think some of the most superficial Christians that I meet are, are Christians who really had a very comfortable life. And I, you know, I'm glad for them, but I, I think something is missing. And some of the most profoundly spiritually deep believers I've ever met are people who've had to walk through some very dark nights of the soul. But in walking through that, something has been refined and reshaped in their hearts, and they are stronger and deeper for it. There's a very interesting example 
in the story of uh, David and Goliath. You know, even if you didn't grow up in church, you at least know uh, the story of David and Goliath, probably. But uh, David, as a teenager, uh, volunteers to step forward and defend the honor of his country as an Israelite and to face an enemy from the Philistine army by the name of Goliath. And Goliath is just huge, massive, RoboCop kind of big guy. And uh, David steps up to volunteer, and this is what the king of Israel, uh, Saul, says to him. He tries to talk him out of it. Saul replied, you are not able to go out against this Philistine and fight him. You are only a young man, and he has been a warrior from his youth. Now listen to what David says in response. But David said to Saul, your servant has been keeping his father's sheep. When a lion or a bear came and carried off a sheep from the flock, I went after it struck it and rescued the sheep from its mouth. When it turned on me, I seized it by its hair, struck it, and killed it. Like, all in a day's work. Like, David, David, he was one tough dude, okay? He probably wore a John Deere cap backwards, chewed tobacco, and had a gun rack in his pickup truck. So David, he says, listen, God has done some things in my life. And then he says this in verse 36, the Lord who rescued me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will rescue me from the hand of this Philistine. Now, I can only imagine that the day when the lion showed up, bad day. The day when the bear showed up, that was a bad day. And I can only imagine that at that point, David might have been saying to himself, you know, God, why is this happening to me? God, where are you? And God, why do I have to go through all this difficulty in my life? But now at this point in his life, he looks back on that and realizes realizes that he was being tested in those moments. He was being made stronger. And here's what I want you to understand. God was not punishing David with the bear and the lion. He was preparing him for something big. I don't know what the bear or the lion is in your life, but it may be that the very thing that you're fighting right now that seems so overwhelming, that may be the thing that prepares you to face some kind of giant down the road that you may not otherwise be able to face. So instead of complaining, rejoice because you know that the testing of your faith is going to produce something in you. Second thing, I need to stay when I just want to run. Let me ask for a raise of hands. How many of you are parents? How many of you have raised children, okay? Raising kids can be frustrating, can it? I think one of the most frustrating things about my kids is that they are like so much like me. Um, But have you ever had a a circumstance in which uh, one of your kids just wanted to give up on something that you knew they could accomplish? And they, they wanted to give up on that, on that math problem or they wanted to give up on that athletic activity that, that they were just learning or they wanted to give up on something in life that you knew they were fully capable of. And as a parent, you know, it, it really breaks your heart, doesn't it? When you know that your child has so much more potential and they just want to quit. I think God feels the same way about his children Those of us who are followers of Christ, when we get in the middle of some difficult times and we just want to run from it. So James says here, listen, he says, let perseverance finish its work, which which implies this, that we can choose to not let perseverance finish its work. See, the great temptation in times of difficulty is to try to get out of those circumstances as quickly as possible, to run from it instead of staying in it and allowing it to develop something in your heart. Can I give you a couple of examples? How about marriage? You know, those of you who are married, I'll bet there was this point in your wedding ceremony where you took a vow and it went something like this, for better or for worse. And see, this is what most married couples, the bride and the groom, they're thinking as they recite those vows. They're thinking something like this. Yeah, I know that's part of the ceremony, but that doesn't really apply to us because all we're going to have is the better. We're not going to have any of the worse. And then you wake up about three years later and you realize, oh, so this is what that was about. Or you wake up a week later and you think, oh, this is the worst part. Okay, now in that moment and when you find yourself in that situation, here's what's going to happen. Quitting will look like a very appealing option. And this culture will say to you, and your friends will say to you, this is not what you signed up for. This is not what you expected. Life is short. You just need to run. Okay? That's always easier. 
It's always easier to run than to stay in and allow God to do something in your heart. Or maybe you're in business and you thought, you know, this business commitment that you, you've made is going to pay off big time, but it's not going so well. And so what do you do? You start looking for a lawyer to help you get out of it when maybe God's will is for you to keep your word and stay in it because maybe it's not about the money you're making. Maybe it's about what might happen in your heart when you persevere. Or what about with our kids, you know? Parents, I think we have to be very, very careful that we don't rescue our kids from every unfair or difficult circumstance in their lives. Your goal is not to make their lives as comfortable as possible. Because in doing so, you may rob them of the opportunity to develop character. We need to stay when we want to run. And here's why this idea is so important. Because something happens in our lives when we stay under the pressure when we allow perseverance to do its work. Go back to verse 4. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. Wouldn't it be great if you could go online and download character? I mean, wouldn't it be nice if you could go to a drugstore, go to a pharmacy and get a pill that you could take that would give you strong faith, that would give you integrity, that would make you a man or woman of courage? Wouldn't it be great if all you had to do was read, read the Bible and go to church to become the person you need to be? But that, that isn't what it takes. The only real path to maturity and to wisdom and to completeness is to persevere when things get difficult because it's in those difficult times that God does work, does a work in your heart. And if you check out too soon, if you run too soon instead of staying there, you may never get to that. I was thinking about this uh, Monday. I was doing some work and uh, I, I had some of this. This is WD-40. How many of you would say you have a can of this somewhere in your home? Go ahead and raise your hand real high. All three campuses, go ahead. Okay. See, this is very interesting. Statistically, four out of five homes at any given time have a can of WD-40. Now, that is what I would call product success, wouldn't you? This stuff was invented in 1953. It's still the same secret formula today, 60 years later. Now, let me ask you a question. Do you know what WD-40 stands for? Okay. Turn to somebody next to you and tell them what you think it stands for. Go ahead, real quick. WD-40, WD-40, uh, da, da, da. Okay, WD, that stands for water displacement. Now, the 40 part, this is really interesting. Do you know why it's called WD-40? It took them 40 tries to figure out the formula. It really, literally means water displacement perfected on the 40th try. And whenever I use this stuff and I see the label... I say, what if they had only tried 20 times? What if they had given up on the 29th time? What if they had given up on the 39th time? They never would have experienced the kind of success that puts a can of this in 80% of American homes. You know what happens when you give up too soon? You never fully become the person you could otherwise be. We need to stay when we just want to run. Number three is this. If I'm going to put my faith in motion in times of difficulty, I need to pray for wisdom when I just want to pray for deliverance. Verse five, if any of you lacks wisdom, he should ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. And see, a lot of church folks read this verse and they think it simply means this. Well, if I have some kind of decision to make, I need to pray, I need to ask God, and he's going to give me wisdom to make the best decision. And certainly that's true, but that's not really the point of this verse because you've got to remember, this was written to a group of people who were living in very, very difficult times. And when you're in the middle of some really deep weeds in your life, the thing you need the most at that moment is wisdom. The wisdom to know how to respond. The wisdom to see your difficulties through the eyes of God. Because that's what wisdom is. It's seeing all of life through the eyes of God. And the prayer that we need to pray is, God, help me see this the way you see it. But if we're honest, we all want to pray a different prayer. We want to pray this prayer. God, get me out of this. 
we want to pray a prayer of deliverance. Now, that's, that's not a bad thing. Uh, I, I don't think it's wrong to pray that kind of prayer. In fact, Jesus, on the night before he was crucified, he was in the Garden of Gethsemane and he prayed. And he said, Father, if it be your will, let this cup, let this pain, let this difficulty pass from me. It's okay to pray for deliverance. Just don't stop there. Because the truth is, the fact of the matter is that it may be better for you to go through the pain than to be delivered from it. And if you go through it, the thing you need the most in the midst of that pain is wisdom so that you don't become a bitter person, that you actually, because of it, become a better person. And so the prayer you pray is this, God, how can I grow through this? How can I not waste a single moment of this suffering? God, how can I utilize this suffering as a way of strengthening my character? So I've got to pray for wisdom, not just for deliverance. So I've got to rejoice when I'd rather complain. I've got to stay when I'd rather run. I've got to pray for wisdom when I want to pray for deliverance. And number four is this, I need to focus on the big picture when I just want to focus on my pain. Okay, again, let's be honest. Does focusing on your pain make you forget it? Does that make it smaller or does it just make it worse? It just makes it bigger. You know what we need to do? We need to focus on something bigger than our difficulty, something bigger than our pain. We need to see a big picture. Let me, let me illustrate what it means to see a big picture. Uh, another survey, uh, if you're not tired of raising your hands, how many of you have seen at least one of the six Star Wars movies? Okay, Star Wars movies? Okay, how many of you, I'm just curious, how many of you have seen all six of the Star Wars movies? Okay, you're the people that lined up like three hours ahead of time for the premiere, yeah. Okay, so imagine this, imagine you go into a movie theater and you watch one minute of one Star Wars movie and then you leave. And you just, by sheer coincidence, you happen to run into George Lucas on the street. And you say, George, you know that Star Wars movie stuff? I was not impressed. Some little green guy named Yoda? I mean, what's that all about? Star Wars? I I just didn't get it. Okay, now, would that be fair to Mr. George Lucas for you to make a judgment about his six movies based on 60 seconds? Of course not. Do you know what we sometimes do with God? We look at one little snapshot of our lives, we look at one little snapshot of history, and we draw a conclusion about the heart of God. And we say, God, I don't understand what you're doing, and this makes no sense, and and you're really not doing your job very well, and we forget that he is the God who was and is and is to come, and there's a much bigger picture than just what's going on in our lives right now. And so in these last few verses here, James tries to help these scattered, persecuted believers to see a bigger picture. And he begins with those who are going through some difficult times. He says, believers in humble circumstances ought to take pride in their high position. In other words, he says, even if life is difficult for you right now, don't focus on the difficulty. Focus on the high position that you have been given through your relationship with Christ. And focus on the fact that you will spend eternity with him. And then he goes to the other end of the spectrum, to those who who may be living a life that's pretty smooth and wrinkle-free. And he says, but the rich should take pride in their humiliation since they will pass away like a wildflower. For the sun rises with a scorching heat and withers the plant. Its blossom falls, its beauty is destroyed. In the same way, the rich will fade away even while they go about their business. He's saying this, and by the way, if things are going pretty well for you right now, if you're pretty comfortable right now, don't think it's going to last forever. Don't focus on that. Remember how brief your life really is. Remember there is an eternity. And then in verse 12, he summarizes this whole thing. And he said, blessed is the one who perseveres under trial. Blessed is the one who perseveres under trial. Because having stood the test, that person will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him. And my friend, no matter what kind of hand life has dealt you, if you're a follower of Christ, when you get to the end of the road, you will stand before the Savior who suffered. And at that moment, his approval, his blessing, his words, well done, good and faithful servant, that's all that's going to matter at that moment. And every single trial or difficulty in this life will, will, will be two things. It will seem so small and so brief. In fact, the Apostle Paul writes, writes something like that in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. He says, We do not lose heart, though outwardly we are wasting away. 
yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles, let me stop right there and just say, okay, everybody in here, every trouble you're going through, it's light and it's momentary if you're a follower of Christ. And you might say, well, wait a minute, Mark, you don't even know my story. You don't even know what I'm going through. How can you say that? No, I don't know what you're going through. But I know this, the Apostle Paul was beaten, he was shipwrecked, he was thrown in jail, he was whipped, he was ultimately put to death, and he says it's light and momentary. Here's why. Because it's achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. Since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. What are you going to choose to focus on? See, life will be difficult. There will be troubling times in life. You will suffer. Not because God is mad at you, but because we live in a fallen world. But if, if, if we want to grow through that, here's what we need to do. We need to choose to rejoice and not just complain. We need to stay instead of running. We need to pray for wisdom. And we need to focus not just on what's right here in front of us, but on the big picture. There's a great summary of this principle in a book called These Things I Wish For You. It was written, written by Lee Pitts. He's the author. And he wrote this book to his grandson as a gift to his grandson. And, and these words are just incredible. He says this, My dear grandson, I hope you learn humili- humility by being humiliated and that you learn honesty by being cheated. I hope that you learn how to mow the lawn and wash the car. And I really hope nobody gives you a brand new car when you turn 16. It will be good if at least one time you can see puppies born and your old dog put to sleep. I hope you have to walk uphill to school with your friends and that you live in a town where you can do it safely. If you want a slingshot, I hope your dad teaches you how to make one instead of buying you one. I hope you get teased by your friends when you have your first crush on a girl. And when you talk back to your mother, I hope you learn what ivory soap tastes like. May you skin your knee climbing a mountain, burn your hand on a stove, and stick your tongue on a frozen flagpole. These are the things I wish for you. Tough times and disappointment. Hard work and happiness. To me, it's the only way to become a man. That's a wise grandfather. And your heavenly father is wise as well. And pain is not his way of beating you up. It will be his way of growing you up. And as we end our time together today, we're going to end it by celebrating in the sacred moment of communion. And communion is simply a way for us to remember, to remember the price that was paid to set us free and to open the door into a relationship with our Heavenly Father through the forgiveness of our sins. And today as we participate in communion and as we remember what happened at the cross, I want us to remember something else as well. That if you're a Christian, if you're a follower of Christ... You follow someone who suffered greatly. For about the last three years of his life, the religious leaders followed him and relentlessly plotted against him. Eventually, they arrested him. And after he was arrested, he was spit upon. He was mocked. A crown of thorns was jammed on his head. They beat him with a whip. And if you've ever seen the movie, The Passion of the Christ, that's very accurate. Then they gave him a cross to carry, and he carried it as far as he could till he couldn't carry it anymore. And then he was nailed through his hands and his feet to that cross, and he hung there for six hours until he died, and he gave his life, and he left behind an empty tomb so that I could be made right with God, and so that you could be made right with God by faith in him alone. And I want you to hear what the scripture says to us. It says, let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. For the joy set before Him, He endured the cross, scorning its shame, and He sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. What was the joy that was set before Him? I would suggest that the joy that was set before Him was the prospect of a redeemed people. You were the joy that was set before Him. And for the joy set before Him, He endured the cross. There are four tables in the room here today. On each table, there is bread and there are goblets of juice. The bread, the unleavened bread, represents His body that was pierced on that cross. The juice represents His blood that flowed down those Roman timbers. 
In just a moment, you'll have the opportunity, if you so choose, to come to one of these tables, take a piece of bread, dip it in the juice, and partake of it as a way of remembering your forgiveness as a follower of Christ and as a way of remembering that we are called to follow in the footsteps of a suffering Savior. And as we remember that today, I pray that that would motivate us to follow the path that we have been called to follow, no matter what difficulties may lie in that path.